guys. Welcome back to another video. I'm your teacher today, Corey J. And today's video is going to be about composition. So I really wanted to make a video of discussing all the different elements and design principles of composition so that when you go forth into your own practice and start to create pieces, you can keep all of these things in mind when you're trying to place emphasis on certain elements or you're trying to evoke a certain emotion or feeling from the viewer. So to start off today, I'm going to read the definition of composition. So composition is the nature of something's ingredients or constituents, the way in which a whole or mixture is made up. So basically when we talk about composition, we're talking about all the different elements of a painting that make it whole. So all the figures in the painting, all the background in the painting, the colors, the tone, the textures, all these elements make up the whole of the painting. And you can use these elements strategically to create a certain vision for your piece and evoke that for your viewer. So I'm gonna break it down in a couple different sections and this is in every design principle of composition, but I hand selected a few to really study and talk about and give examples about that I feel like would really help you along your path. So here we go. Okay, so the first section we're gonna talk about today is creating a focal point. So a focal point is the center of interest of activity. So when you have your painting and you're making up all the elements, you wanna create a focal point in your painting to draw the viewer to that one area. Now some paintings have multiple focal points and the more focal points that you have, the harder it gets. Uh, so if you were just starting out, you should just stick to probably one. Uh, and then you can add a couple and really lead the eye around the painting. So for focal point, I've separated a focal point into three sections that we're gonna discuss. So the first one is going to be isolation. So here in this painting, you can see that on one side of the piece, there are multiple figures all together. And then on the other side of the piece, there's just the one figure. And this is a way that you can draw attention to the single figure because he's isolated from the rest of the figures in the piece. So in some areas of your painting, if you have a lot of elements or a lot of figures together, and then you have one by itself, that creates this isolation, which in turn makes the viewer drawn to the single figure. So when you first view this painting, you'll be drawn to that single figure in the piece. So the second different way that you can express a focal point or draw the viewer to one area of the piece is by using contrast. So we talked about this a bit in the color theory video, but basically you can use contrast to draw attention to a certain area. So you can do that by using complementary colors. You can do that by using black and white, or you can do that by using different values and different tones in the piece. So for example, with this piece here, you can see that the lady on the swing is in these peachy red tones, and then all the area around her is green. So the artist here has used complementary colors to draw your eye to the lady on the swing. Here's another example of using color to create a focal point. So here, Monet has used complementary colors to draw your eye to the sun. So the sun in this piece is very orange and very bright, and the rest of the colors in the piece are calm blues. And when you first look at this piece, you're drawn right to that sun because it's the only point amidst all this other color that really stands out. Now you can also do a similar idea here if you have a very dark piece and then you have one element that's white or light, then that will be creating a focal point to that light piece. Or in the opposite, you can have a whole piece that's nice and bright and light and then have one very dark area of the piece. And in turn, that will also create a focal point. Now, the last way we're gonna discuss to create a focal point is by placement of elements in your piece. So depending on how you use elements in your piece, your eye will be drawn to a certain area. So to start off, we have this piece here. And you can see that the artist has used vanishing points, which are lines that the whole piece is created around directed at one area in the piece. So here you can see that our eye is drawn straight to that window area and that all the pieces align in perspective to that one point. 
So in this piece, that would be the focal point. Now you often see the same element in this next piece, which is that vanishing point. So oftentimes when you look at architectural drawings or drawings of cities or paintings of cities and places, you can see that they're all drawn in the same perspective, taking your eye all the way to the vanishing point of the piece. And that's the same for this piece here. Another way to create a focal point is just to have one main subject in your piece. So oftentimes when you look at portraits, you can see that there's just one main element and your eyes often drawn to the eye area. Whereas in this piece here, you're clearly drawn straight to the apple. So the background's pretty plain, there's not much else going on, and then you have that strong green color of the apple right on this man's face that takes you right into the piece right in that point. So like I said, oftentimes if you're creating portraits, you just want the portrait of the person or thing or pet to be the focal point of the piece. You don't wanna have a crazy background distracting you or taking your eye away. So that's another way that you can create a focal point in your work. And then the last way we're gonna talk about placement of elements is through the concept of rule of thirds. So you may have heard this before, you may have not, but basically the rule of thirds is when you take your page or your painting or your drawing area and you divide it into nine equal sections by using two vertical lines uh, up and down and two vertical lines horizontally. And then where those lines intersect in the middle, there's four points created. And those four points are where you wanna place the main elements of your piece. So for example, in this piece here, the big wave that's placed is placed on one of those four intersected areas. And this helps to create some movement uh, available for your eye. So if you were to place the wave right in the center of the piece, it wouldn't be as interesting because you would just look at the wave, there's not much going on around it, and that would be it. But because the wave is placed on one of the intersections of the rule of thirds, your eye looks at the wave, then it bounces around the piece and has some areas to look at and then is drawn back to that area. So when you think about your piece, you wanna use the rule of thirds to place your main elements. Now I use this a lot in my work when I decide where to place elements on my piece, especially if I wanna make the piece more involved and allow the viewer's eye to kind of have a journey throughout the piece instead of just stopping at the main element. You can also see in this famous Salvador Dali piece that he's used the rule of thirds to place the main elements of this piece as well. So you can see the two main melting clocks are each placed really close to an intersection on the rule of thirds. And that kind of gives your eye a bit of time to journey around the piece. When you first look at the piece, you're drawn to those areas and then you can kind of bounce around a little bit and take in the whole piece. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about balance in artwork. So I'm just gonna read the definition as related to artwork. So balance is an overall distribution of weight in a composition. So elements each have a visual weight when you're planning. And you wanna keep this in mind when you're making a composition so that when the viewer looks at the piece, they feel comfortable. Oftentimes with, if items are out of balance, it doesn't give a sense of harmony and makes the viewer feel a little bit uneasy. So one way to achieve balance in your piece is to have a balance of proportions. So for example, an area that's really small and then an area that's very large. So you can see here in this piece, you have a collection of animals that are very large and closer to the viewer. And then in the other side of the piece, you have a lot of smaller figures that are further back in the work. And this starts to create balance to the piece. So when you look at it, it feels more comfortable. If both the front animals and the back people were the same size and value in terms of depth, the piece wouldn't be as comfortable or interesting to look at. You can also see balance in this piece with the large building and then the small people on the side of the piece. So you have these two elements, big versus small. It makes it more comfortable to look at. Another way to create balance in your work is by balancing both sides to your piece and making them symmetrical. So here you can see the famous painting, The Last Supper, and Leonardo da Vinci has created balance by creating the same amount of figures on both sides of the piece. 
So the last way that you can achieve balance is by cropping or by framing your subjects appropriately. So here you have one of my paintings and I purposely cropped it in so that you can see how it would look like if I didn't give it enough room to breathe and it would be unbalanced. So in this piece here, you can see that the area by his shirt and the area by his hands are so close to the frame, it feels very uncomfortable and there's not much room to breathe. Whereas we look at the full piece here, you can see that the center point has a lot more area around it and is much more balanced and obviously the second piece is a lot more comfortable to look at because there's a lot more room for you to take in the piece without feeling constrained by the borders. So unless you're going for an uncomfortable feeling, which you might be in your piece, if you want it to feel more balanced and comfortable, you wanna make sure that you leave enough room around your subject so that they can breathe and that someone's eye can bounce around the piece comfortably. Okay, so the next element I wanna talk about is movement and rhythm. So for the purpose of this exercise, I'm referring to a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement or sound. So basically you can create this with your artwork and a lot of times you can create rhythm by repetition in the piece. So if you look at this piece here, there's a lot of movement in it and there's a really beautiful rhythm to it. And that's because the main face is repeated all the way around the piece. This creates movement and excitement in the piece and really makes for a strong composition. Alternatively, in this piece by Van Gogh, you can see a beautiful sense of rhythm, and that's because a lot of these flowers and the stems of the flowers have been repeated. So you can see a lot of the stem shapes have been repeated throughout the piece, a lot of the same type of flower and the color scheme has been repeated, and also with the yellows in the top corner, there's lots of repetition there as well, and this creates a beautiful movement about the piece and is a really strong composition. So that's it for these first elements of composition that I wanted to talk about today and I hope they really affect how you think about planning your work. And just in terms of planning, that's something else I wanted to talk about too. So it's important to plan. I find that when you plan, you're more successful. So for me, I always try and plan my paintings ahead of time and that way I can play with the elements and make sure that I have a strong composition. So just like you would go on a trip, you pack your suitcase, you plan for that, you make sure that you have your toothbrush, make sure you have everything. And the same goes for when you're creating a piece of work. You wanna make sure that you're planning all the elements so that you can achieve what you're trying to and relay the message that you want to with your work. I really like using tracing paper because you can move the elements around and see through to the other side. So let's say I have a painting and I wanted to plop in a fish. I could draw the fish on one piece of tracing paper and have the main elements of my piece on another and then I could take the fish and move it around being able to see through to the other side and plan where the fish looks best or what position the fish looks best in. So using tracing paper is a really good tool for planning for your work. Another good thing to do, and I know that a lot of design professionals do this, is to make thumbnail sketches. So you would draw yourself a couple different boxes and then you'd fill in each box with quick, quick thumbnail sketches of the ideas that you have and the elements and where you want them to be. And then you would take that preliminary sketch and develop it larger until you got to your final piece. Uh, I always plan, like I said, using tracing paper, so I'll do my final piece on tracing paper before I move it to my canvas or my canvas paper or whatever I'm drawing on, and then I'll just use charcoal transfer paper to transfer it over. That way I'm not erasing on my canvas constantly and making little dents in it by going back and forth and moving things around. I like to do that process all off of the canvas, and then I can transfer it to my canvas when I'm ready to paint. Okay, so I hope this was helpful for you and I hope you learned a little bit about composition and you can take that back with you going forward when you plan your own pieces. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like this video and leave a comment down below if you have any questions for me that I didn't answer and I'll talk to you soon.